life, culture and current events from a biblical perspective. 2020 with Neil Johnson on Vision. Let's turn our attention to the international bias that appears to be so obvious against the people of Israel. And of course, around the conflict that has been generating now for some time with the Palestinian people and their claims on what is known as the West Bank, there are some challenging things to think about as to how international bodies consider the nation of Israel. Let's get a focus on the United Nations and what is a bias against Israel and what some see as an attempt to delegitimise it. Hugh Kitson is back with us, well-known Australian author and documentary maker, including the popular Whose Land documentary. Hugh Kitson, welcome back to 2020. It's very good to be with you once again. Hugh, some will say, why is there such a significant bias against Israel? Uh, Perhaps people feel sorry for the Palestinian people, but there no doubt is an issue of what is true in international law in all of that and who can interpret history. What are your thoughts about international bias? Well, the United Nations certainly, um, uh, ever since the Six-Day War of 1967 have had this um, uh, agenda to try and delegitimize Israel. And to give you some idea, um, so many people talk about the West Bank, uh, which Jordan renamed as the West Bank. It's actually Judea and Samaria. They start the clock of the conflict in 19. 19- 67, when in reality, uh, when five Arab nations invaded Israel, the nascent state of Israel on the 15th of May 1948, they were in violation of the United Nations Charter, Article 2. Um, that, that invasion was every bit as illegal as the Russian invasion of Ukraine is today, and the uh, United Nations completely ignored that fact. Yes, the West Bank was occupied territory between 1948 and 1967, and uh, uh, Jordan illegally annexed it, and the United Nations, funnily enough, never recognized that annexation at all. Neither did the Arab League, but only Britain and Pakistan, and of course the ancient Jewish capital, uh, the old city of Jerusalem, along with the surrounding areas, became falsely known as Arab East Jerusalem. And, um, you know, there was no East Jerusalem or West Jerusalem before 1948. In fact, the whole of the Jewish population, well, the whole of the population of Jerusalem before, say, the 1860s, was living entirely within the city walls. And by the 1860s, it had a a majority Jewish population. Um, So there has been this uh, bias. It's it's actually really a, a complete and utter lie. There is no such thing as an Arab city known as Jerusalem. It is the ancient Jewish capital, and everyone wants to deny that. Um, so, uh, and this is sort of carried through into the United Nations, and what is called East Jerusalem is referred to as occupied Palestinian territory. Now, there has never been any agreement or international binding agreement or treaty um, with the Palestinians that actually gives them that uh, gives them that territory or sovereignty over it. So on the one hand, you've got the United Nations passing all these resolutions, uh, but on the other hand, uh, international law in reality contradicts what the United Nations is doing. Now, there are bodies like the United Nations who have a permanent commission of inquiry that 
goes on and it's focused on Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, Apparently uh, a very unique thing for a specific permanent commission of inquiry to be conducted, uh, which with its bias goes against one nation. Well, yes. Uh, I mean, the the fact that it's there's you've got this commission in, of inquiry focused on the one uh, democratic state in the Middle East, and you've got countries like Iran that are um, it's a terrorist entity terrorizing the whole of the Middle East. Um, its internal human rights record is absolutely appalling. And you've got China and the Uyghurs. Um, you've got the the uh, the Russian situation in Ukraine, and really the United Nations is not focusing on any of these things. Why is it focusing on on Israel? Um, one can only say that this commission of inquiry basically is is um, an ongoing blood libel on an international scale. That's exactly how I would describe it. And um, my my friend Richard Kemp, who has often been into bat for Israel with the UN Human Rights Council, has, um, has really questioned the legitimacy of this. So the legitimacy of a permanent commission of inquiry. Uh, interestingly, the UN, Australia, appears to take its cues from uh, the United Nations uh, with some recent decisions made. What are your concerns that Australia might take its cues from a organisation that has a one-sided bias against what we might understand, as you say, as a legitimate democracy? Uh, I, I think it's I think it's a huge problem, and um, one has to ask the question: Why are they doing it? Now I don't know the answer to that. I think um, it would be very interesting to, um, to, to to examine uh, the reasons behind it, actually. Um, but it's going to be very difficult to do. Uh, now I've I've written an article on this on this whole matter, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if there's any response from the Albanese government on some of the issues that I raise in it. Now it's not just that Australia takes a position like this and backing away from the recognition of West Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and uh, some other issues we've talked about before, uh, raising support uh, away and above for an organisation that has been known to support uh, terrorism. Uh, but the thought here that there are other nations like uh, the British government who have taken an alternative view and they're actually moving to recognise uh, the uh, issues around West Jerusalem and, uh, and, and, uh, and the developments within Israel. What are your thoughts about what's been happening with the British government? Well, I think the British government in that respect are, are really heading in the, in the right direction. Um, the previous prime minister, who was only in office for seven weeks, um, had talked about moving the British embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and um, she was going to give due consideration to that. Um, uh, she she would have had uh, a mother of all battles with the British Foreign Office in doing so, um, and uh, the current Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, while he hasn't specifically said that he uh, is going to move the embassy uh, to this point in time anyway, he has recognized Jerusalem, and he didn't say West Jerusalem, he said Jerusalem as Israel's capital. So um, things are moving in the right direction there, and um, th- there is uh, there is a good relationship with Israel, uh, between Israel and the British government, uh, despite the fact that really in the past the British government has betrayed uh, the Jewish people and the emergence of the Jewish state, the, the British government actually 
was very negative towards Israel. But what's happening in Britain is, is I think, quite encouraging in many respects. How concerned do you think Christian listeners to our conversation ought to be, Hugh, around the idea that our government is turning away from uh, an open-handed support to Israel? And uh, would there be ramifications from that? Uh, Yes, there would. Um, The Jewish community is very concerned that the Albanese government will go one step further and actually recognize the state of Palestine. And um, like the United Nations, it seems to me that the government is ignoring uh, Palestinian terrorism, which is an ongoing uh, is an ongoing thing, both with Hamas and also with the Palestinian Authority. And um, uh, I think Christians should be supporting uh, the Jewish community in raising their concerns. Uh, the other thing is really a spiritual matter, and every I guess everyone in your audience, in the audience listening now will recognize um, Genesis 12.3, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And if if the um, Australian government moves against the purposes of God, then really um, the Aussie government's going to be in a, in a, on a collision course with the Lord. We may be moving to shaky ground. Uh, Hugh Kitson, a well-known Australian author and documentary maker, including the popular Whose Land documentary, part one of a two-part series is out and uh, some fundraising going on for part two. You can connect with Hugh Kitson at whoseland.tv. That's online at whoseland.tv. Hugh Kitson. Thanks so much for taking some time to share your thoughts with us today on 2020. Thank you very much, Neil, and God bless you. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.